Hey everybody. Um, I'm in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. I'm at the Great Blue Heron Nature Reserve, just outside of Chilliwack. Uh, Chilliwack is just northeast of Abbotsford, where I live. And Abbotsford is right on the border with Washington State. And I came here today to go on a members only bird walk. So um, this location is uh, well known for its uh, uh, great blue heron nesting area. Um, you can't really see too much this time of year because uh, of the foliage in the trees. So I have seen some herons overhead and I just uh, finished having a, um, a guided tour with our guide Kevin who kind of looked like Rock Hudson but uh, he registered on my gaydar I might be wrong about that but he was very cute and uh, very nice um, so uh, it's around noon the light isn't great. Um, also, the views today are not so clear because uh, whenever the dry, sunny season starts, that's when the forest fires happen and the wildfires. So I can tell there's smoke in the air. It's kind of uh, giving the mountain views that hazy look. Uh, so. Uh, we saw lots of, I'm not a serious bird watcher, so I was kind of nodding and smiling whenever Kevin would say, do you hear that or do you see that? Yeah, yeah, okay, Kevin. Um, and uh, so I'm just, uh, I'm up in an observation tower. And uh, I'll give you a little quick 360 here so you can see. Uh, okay, and they have some signs up here explaining. Yeah. So, the Great Blue Heron Nature Reserve actually was a Canadian military facility where they did training, I think, probably during World War II. So, the Fraser Valley here used to be almost all, or practically all, wetlands, but they drained them. They drained three quarters of the wetlands here so that they could farm and uh, build housing for people here. Um, so these wet these lagoons are uh, sort of a little wetland sanctuary for the birds. Yeah, they these are man-made uh, lagoons that they've built here for the military. And I, I don't remember when the military um, when they gave up this location. I'm not sure. Uh, so anyway, because I'm, because I'm a transplanted Virginian in Canada, I just thought I would talk about some differences. Um, oh, yeah, Chilliwack, actually the name of a, I just want to bring this up, Chilliwack was the name of a Canadian rock band in the 1970s and 80s, and I, I don't really know if they really, uh, were known in the U.S. Maybe there might be some people in the U.S. remember Chilliwack the band. It was a Vancouver band, and they uh, took the name Chilliwack. And Chilliwack is a uh, Coast Salish um, word. Um, the Coast Salish are one of the Pacific Northwest uh, people, uh, indigenous peoples. So uh, Chilliwack and Coast Salish means Valley of Many Streams. So there are a lot of a lot of rivers and streams that flow into this that flow into the Fraser River. So, um, oh, and uh, I could tell Kevin picked up on the fact that I'm not from around here. He was talking about a bird call where you could hear Z Z Z, and then he looked at me and he said, or in some cases Z Z Z, because that's the difference. The Canadians will say Z, and Americans will say Z. Uh, I also noticed Kevin, he would say things like uh, these ones and those ones, whereas I would say these and those. Um, 
I don't know. There might be Americans that do that. I don't know. Sometimes these differences are regional, not necessarily national. Kevin also said uh, again, so uh, rather than again. Um, so it's funny how I I still have um, whatever is left of my Virginia accent, and people pick up on it pretty quickly. Um, so. Yeah, differences between Canada and the U.S. I was thinking about this, um, the Second Amendment, you know, the right to bear arms. That's There's a big difference between policies and attitudes about guns, gun rights. So there is no Second Amendment in Canada. And so people, um, they, they don't really understand this gun culture in the U.S., and it's, uh, they still have held fast to British traditions, so they're very, Canadians just seem more deferential to authority to me. That's just my impression over the years. And um, my dad was actually a member of the NRA, and um, he was from a remote area in the mountains of West Virginia, and his family, they were German immigrants who had arrived in the 18th century, and they'd settle on the frontier. And so they had to be self-sufficient. So they needed they needed guns to to survive because they used guns. Um, oh, there's some horse some horseback riders here using the trails. Yeah, look at that. So my dad, um, you know, he grew up with guns. They had to hunt sometimes to survive. And. Uh, so he was very familiar. He wasn't a gun nut. I mean, he, we, I grew up, there were hunting rifles in the house. But um, I, my dad was so busy with his, his job, his business, and the kids. You know, I, he rarely went hunting because he would have to go out for a weekend or for the whole day, you know, for hunting. And he just normally didn't have that kind of time on his hands. So um, my sisters and my my sisters, my brother and I, we kind of would make fun of my dad getting the American Rifleman uh, magazine or whatever that the NRA published. And I remember that the the NRA magazine it would be filled with uh, situations where the police had uh, uh, come into somebody's home, searching things, and I don't know, sort of that sort those sort of stories and. Um, I'm sorry that we kind of made fun of my dad and his NRA membership because uh, I think he had a good sense of why why we needed uh, gun rights and the Second Amendment. Um, my dad was pretty wise man, so we cut, we he was a hillbilly really, and we we made fun of him. And I'm sorry that we did that because he was a good guy. Um. So another thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, I did a video recently mentioning the Five Eyes and um, Scott Creighton from American Everyman and the Church Dog 42 channel. He was uh, sort of talking. He was he 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 believes that the Five Eyes were created to um, so that. Um, those five countries, those five Anglo countries, the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, could spy on each other's uh, um, citizens or residents and not worry about whatever legal restrictions there were. Well, I don't really agree with that because um, the U.S. does have some legal restrictions on um, domestic spying, but the other countries not so much and um so i don't know people in the u.s seem to think that they're the same sort of uh uh like fourth amendment rights that's the um prohibits the illegal search and seizure but uh other anglo countries don't have those protections um especially canada now i found an article uh, where Edwin, Edward Snowden, um, he, he said that Canada, from his uh, experience working as an NSA-CIA contractor, 
Canada has this is his wording. Canada has the worst oversight of all in the Western world. I think those are the words. Yeah, I ha, um, I'll provide the link in the show notes. So yeah, Canada. When I first arrived in Canada, people were telling me, "Oh yeah, the RCMP. That's the Royal, Royal Canadian Mounted Police." They keep files on everybody and anybody they want, and there is no oversight. And, yeah, I mean, the government, they can just spy on you, and that's why, oh, I want to give a little shout-out to the, the CSIS, the CSE and the RCMP right now, because I'm, I'm sure I'm on their radar. So the Five Eyes, I don't think they were created for that. Uh, it could be that the U.S. had that in mind. Other countries, not so much. I think it's just a... A natural Anglo network of spy agencies um, and another reason I don't think that the Five Eyes are created uh, for that necessarily is I seem to recall from my days at NSA that the UK the UK did not have um, they had the same restrictions. They had to be careful. They were not allowed to spy on uh, U.S. persons, they were called. That was the category of anybody who was either a citizen, either a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident or green card holder, I guess at that time it was called. So um, I'm not, I'm, the Five Eyes, I don't think it was necessarily created for that reason. The U.S. might have had that in mind, but um, not so much uh, the other countries, I don't think. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts about the Five Eyes. And, um, yeah, the other, so, well, I think that's about it for now. So I hope you enjoyed this little bit of nature and um, talk about the Second Amendment. And, oh, another thing I want, I forgot. There was one thing about, um, the Bill of Rights. Now, this is really weird, and I'm sure there are going to be Canadians who will dispute this, but um, I have encountered Canadians uh, in person and online who do not believe in the First Amendment. They believe in restricting speech. You know, they don't believe in hate speech, so-called hate speech, and they believe in restrictions on uh, freedom of speech. And one reason that was given to me is that we don't want to be like Americans. I know that sounds strange, but there is a strong resistance among Americans to, among Canadians, to not be like Americans. They don't want to be like the U.S. system, the U.S. government, uh, Americans culturally, even though, you know, the, the, the two cultures are very similar. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. There's this resistance to being like the U.S. or like Americans. And it reminds me, when I've been in Holland, I speak Dutch, and when I've been in Holland, I encountered a similar attitude. The Dutch, the Dutch will not, they, you know, they're famous for riding their bikes everywhere, but the Dutch will not wear bicycle helmets. And I was told it's because they don't want to look like Germans. Germans are very safety conscious. They will wear their bicycle helmets when they're riding bikes and the Dutch just don't want to be mistaken for German. <laughs> and so it's very funny but that's the way it is when you're next door to a much more dominant uh, country and culture. You just don't want to look like them. Okay, that's it for now. So. Um, Hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for listening and have a good day. Have a good week and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.